Hello, everybody. Officially, welcome to this session. Um, happy International Women's Day. Um, I'm Tess from WordPress VIP and Automatic. I have the pleasure of introducing you to our next speaker, Rich Tabor, for the talk, Design is an Expedition of the Multifaceted Nature of Design. Rich is a product manager at Automatic and works on making WordPress's publishing processes more intuitive and human. As a design enthusiast, I'm so excited to be taken on this journey through the art of design. Please welcome Rich. <laughs> Thank you. Design is more than the way things look. Design is much more than the way things work. Design is the culmination of purpose, intention, and human connection. It's a transformative craft that weaves functionality and meaning into the fabric of being, into our spaces around us, both digital and physical. I'm Rich Tabor, a product manager at Automatic and core contributor to WordPress. I wear many hats these days, but the one I'm most fond of is that of design. This is my first time in Taiwan, my first WordCamp Asia. I'm stoked to be here. I came all the way from Atlanta, and I know the organizers put on a wonderful weekend ahead of us, and I'm so proud of the energy of this community. Uh, so let's give it a round, to, a round of applause to all the organizers and volunteers and the sponsors who've helped make this possible. <laughs> the one thing that I'm most looking forward to over this weekend is to connect. Connect with people, connect with ideas. I want to hear what you're inspired about, what you're passionate about, what you're struggling with, within WordPress and outside. I think it's interesting that we connect on a human level to elevate what we're doing as designers. So my goal today is to impart some wisdom, my passion, what I love about design, what I think design is, and then perhaps we can elevate as a community within WordPress, but also with every single thing that we produce as humans. Now as we dive into the art of design, let's first consider visionary Taiwanese sculptor Yu Yu Yang. Now Yang was known for transforming ordinary spaces into extraordinary experiences. Let's take a little time back, a little time uh, to think about this story here. Yang was a young creative in the middle of Taipei. There's this park. He would go to this park and observe, sit and watch, watch as the children played on the paths, watch as the workers hurried through from point A to point B, and watch as the elderly sat and listened and watched as the day unfolded. Now, Yang didn't see just a park. He didn't see a square in the middle of the city. He saw an opportunity. He saw an opportunity to express creative intention, to make an interactive gallery, not just a path. So he created these sculptures, beautiful sculptures. They rose out of the ground. They created a sense of expression, of curiosity. Adults would stop to touch to view, to take photos of, to take photos with. Children would play on them. They would hang from them. Benches, old benches, became these flowing forms, encouraging rest and reflection. The important thing here is that Yang observed, created these experiences, and the people changed. Now, as we dive into this art of design, this craft that we all know and love, I want to carry with us how Yang approached design, how he gained an empathetic understanding, observed the people he was designing for, and created intentional experiences. And let's start with what I would consider the most crucial part of design, purpose. Purpose is a reason for being, right? When we think of what design is, we like to hone in on aesthetics, or technicalities, we want to know how something works. We want to know if something's beautiful. But really, the most challenging part of design is not on those fronts. It's simply getting the requirements right. That is, getting the purpose right. 
And to do that, we use what's called the design thinking process. Now, the design thinking process is a user-centric approach to problem solving that encourages creativity, innovation, and practical solutions. There are four key steps here. The first is to gain that empathetic understanding for the people that you're designing for by observing, just as Yang did in the early mornings at the park, we understand not just what users are doing, we understand their motivations, their feelings, their challenges. We're going beyond those surface level assumptions into what's deeper, the meaning behind this. So I encourage all of you in the room here to meet with the people you're designing for. Set up time to watch them. Watch them engage and then engage with them. Because that's how we can build these experiences that really hone in on purpose. Now the second step is to define the core challenge, to synthesize insights into an actionable statement. If you followed some of my work online, one thing I'm very consistent on is approaching solutions with action. If we can't come up with an actionable solution, it's probably something we need to table and take a look at later. Now, when we're defining this core problem, it's not about stating the problem as we see it. It's about framing it in a way that focuses on users' needs and their expectations. So by observing, we see these real-world complexities. And we ask ourselves the question, like, what is the fundamental challenge that our users are facing? I have an example of a problem statement here. And this is, uh, perhaps many of us have e-commerce clients or have worked with e-commerce sites. So this example here, we start by identifying the group. Who do we want to help? Who are the primary users that we need to design for? In this case, it's online shoppers between 25 and 40. Perhaps that's the target market already set by the client. The next step in defining this problem is to identify the core challenge, the root cause, what is actually happening here. We can only get this by observing. In this example, we noticed that perhaps it's difficult to navigate, to check out from. Maybe there's too many steps. Maybe there's something missing. Maybe the icon looks funky. The goal is where we transition from the problem to the potential. Here, we took that core challenge that we have observed users running into, and we distill it down to something simple here. What is the goal to simplify this purchase flow? That is something that's much more actionable than trying to come up with some, some arbitrary way to make more sales. The last step of defining the core problem is to outline the outcome. What do we want to do? And what do we want to have that accomplish to boost sales? Right? It's, it's simple. Like This problem statement is very succinct, very direct, and that's purposeful. Because otherwise, we end up with lots of ideas that don't focus in the right direction. Now, when defining this core problem, we need to find the problem, not the solution. Even when I'm up here explaining this, in my head, the first thing I think of is, what are the, what are the ways to fix this? That's not really the, the way that we need to progress through building beautiful solutions because it's about solving the right problem. We can come up with lots of interesting ideas, but if we're not focused, we're not pointed in the right direction, we're gonna end up burning out our engineering teams, burning out our design teams, as we build ideas that don't really have purpose. So we gained that empathetic understanding. We defined the core problem. Now the third step is where we transition into the more creative and dynamic phase of the design thinking process. But that's when we can ideate, to come up with ideas, lots of them. Generate as many ideas as possible. Designers, we like to call this divergent thinking. Just throw everything on the table, see where things land. Think outside the conventional thinking and push the boundaries of, of what we can actually accomplish even. Because at this point, it's just about focusing on that right solution and just throw out the ideas. Now, creative thinkers, designers, developers, marketers, a lot of us in the room here, we like to start here, right? This is the fun part. This is the part where you open up Figma, you start throwing pieces together, and you try to see what looks nice. 
or you'll open up the code editor and you start placing in components to see if you can get something working. If we keep doing that, if we keep starting here, we just lose a lot of momentum because we're, like again, we're, we're just going into tangents instead of focusing on the right problem. So once you have lots of ideas, you'll start to see some bubbling to the top. We get to take those ideas and prototype them, test them, see if they work, see if there's merit to these. So the fourth step is to test and prototype. When you're building these prototypes, they should be quick to make. They should be you know, something small, but just enough to prove the idea. Is this going to work? Is it functional? Is it viable? Is it reliable? And if it's not, that's great too, because it's all about failing fast to get through these ideas that are in the right direction and figure out what is the actual approach that has merit here. One thing I consistently tell folks is that you can never underestimate the skill it takes to serve and deliver prototypes quickly. So the best designers and the best engineers and the best marketers even are those who can put together ideas quickly and prove them out quickly. So as we've seen through the design thinking process, every step that we start with here is built on a foundation of purpose, and it addresses specific users' needs and their challenges. But good design takes that and goes a step further. Design is intention. Design is intention. Intention essentially connects the ideas between purpose and function. When you're designing with intention, it's about aligning design with the natural inclinations of people. What do we expect? What is the intended result here? And how does that match our expectations? The result is that a design's intended use is hopefully obvious. I know we have lots of experiences where it's not obvious, where it's tricky and convoluted, perhaps. But really, intention is about finding out how to design experiences that are obvious. And how do we do that? As designers, we have two key tools in our toolbox. That is affordances and signifiers. Now, affordances are the characteristics of an object that naturally suggest how it should be used. Let's think of uh, an example here, maybe a door. I have a door right here, and it has a handle that I grab onto. Naturally, even my stance, I'm in this position to pull. This is an affordance to the door that I need to pull this to open it towards me. Let's contrast that with another door over here with a flat plate. This is one that you push, you lean into, and it pushes inward. These are the natural inclinations of humans, of our anatomy, how we react to these objects in the phys physical space that help us learn how to interact with these digital, uh, with these physical and even digital affordances. In the digital context, we have a lot of different affordances, but they're all very unique in what they're providing. Take a look at the toggle here. Its dual functionality suggests that something is either on or off, like many light switches in many countries. It lights up when it's on, and it turns off when it's off. Now, this binary choice is a very intentional physical cue that we can relate to as people. There's also checkboxes. Now, these are influenced by physical forms, perhaps like the doctor's office, where you can check off one or even multiple items. And then we have radio buttons. Radio buttons allow for only one choice at a time. What's cool about radio buttons is that these are inspired by radio buttons where selecting one action would physically pop up the other buttons on the device. I, I remember being a kid and hearing your favorite song on the radio, and you, you press the record real quick on the cassette, and you listen to it. As soon as you're done, you hit stop, and it clanks away, and all the buttons come back up. That's exactly the same sort of physical input that we've translated into these digital affordances. So I encourage you, as you lean into this idea of affordances and as I review signifiers, to look through 
the rooms, through the hallways, through your application, uh, applications, as you're using these softwares and these physical environments to identify the affordances that we can use to better our design. Now, in the landscape of design, signifiers are our guides. These are the signals that communicate not just the possibility of an action, but also how to interact with it. We have a typical link here, underline and all. This is probably the most classic visual cue that has stood the test of time, right? Every time you see text that's underlined, you know that I can click on that and get a new portal of information right in front of me that's relevant. We also have search icons. It's a magnifying glass that's represented by something that magnifies, enlarges, reveals. I know as soon as I see one of these, I can input a query and get more information. And equally intuitive are those visual cues for our media players, play and pause, where these are universal across the board. Every single media application would leverage these. If it doesn't, you wouldn't know how it worked. That's how signifiers play a role in our application design. If we get a bit closer to WordPress, we have the classic save button at the top right or the top left of the editor. Now this WordPress publish button transitions to a state of processing once you click it. So it signals to you something is happening. This page is responsive. Your page is being saved. And once it's done, it transitions back out of this. So those signals are helping you understand what is happening without you having to really understand what's happening. Signifiers are more than just design elements. They are the visual cues, the language of user interface. So when you're designing your next project, consider the intentionality behind the art, behind the craft, those affordances and those signifiers that make this experience much more effortless. Now, while intention is about those deliberate decisions that we make as designers during that design process, there's another aspect of design that connects the dots between purpose and intention. And this one's dear to me. Design is experience. Again, design is more than the way things look and much more than the way things work. It's also about how they feel. The story, the journey, the collective elements throughout the entire experience. We call that user experience, or rather, UX. User experience design considers how each interaction works together to help the user accomplish their goal, their mission, their vision. While we often start with the individual interactions, like all the minute details, that consists of user experience, I encourage you to kind of broaden that perspective and pull up from the ground and look at things from an activity-centric perspective. By focusing on activities, we actually get a big picture view that helps us have end-to-end -end workflows that are supporting the user, not necessarily isolated instances. You can think of an activity as a set of tasks, a bunch of things that you need to accomplish, that you wrap it all together, and then you achieve a higher goal with. So when you also start at the task level, you're designing in a restrictive bubble. You're stuck with this one unit of control. Rather than from the activity perspective, there's a much broader perspective to lean into. And that's what really leans us into the ideas of forward-thinking design. Consider a photographer whose goal is to take photos upload them onto a computer, and then output the final edited images. Now, task-based design and the thought process along those lines would lead you to identify the tasks that they would be necessary, like um, editing an image, increasing the brightness, cropping it, and whatnot. But then activity-centric design pulls up from that perspective, and it really looks into the whole flow from I need to upload my images to I need to share them with my friends or my clients or my audience. Yeah, the idea behind activity-centric design is that it's much more broad than those small pieces so that we can come up with ideas that are much more supportive to users. In the context of WordPress, we have so many tasks, right? You can 
edit copy, add plugins, add themes, uh, review post, approve post, add users. I could probably spend the rest of the conversation just going over WordPress tasks and activities. But when I think of WordPress, I try to focus on the main activity, the big thing in the room. And that's to publish. By focusing on publishing in WordPress, we can create solutions and experiences within WordPress that help you accomplish your goal, to publish, to share. Uh, here's an example. WordPress users don't want to add a featured image to your post. It's kind of broad, right? It's kind of direct. But hear me out. WordPress users don't want to add featured images to their post. What they want to do is share that post with their audience and have a relevant, beautiful image that shows up in the feed with it. That's what you want. So the task would be upload an image. The activity is, I need to share this with my friends. If we take this task-centric approach, and we did the design thinking process, what we do is we end up with solutions that are only about uploading an image. We lose everything to the left and right that could potentially be the novel solution. Perhaps the, the ideal solution is not even uploading an image. It could be there's some sort of image creation experience where there's, it, maybe it's a cover block and you can add a logo, add a heading, that's the, the, your post title. Maybe you design it yourself, or maybe there's a default one that you've uploaded one time, and every time you share a link, it looks nice. That's what I do on my blog. But the key is, is that with an activity-centered perspective, we keep our eyes open to the possibilities that what we think is the right task might not, not even be the right task. Experience is about that cohesion, that holistic journey, and supporting people through their goals, through their visions. From every pixel that we draw in a canvas to every brick laid in the physical space, it's all the same. But experience is a culmination of disciplines. It's not just an art, it's also very much a science. It requires us not only to dream, to visualize, and produce as designers, but also to execute, to turn these ideas into a reality. Design is engineering. Now, I know this can be touchy. Uh, as designers, we don't like to hear that design is engineering, and engineers don't like to hear that design is engineering either. Uh, but really, it is. You know, design and engineering have such an interplay because engineering bridges that gap between experience and execution. While we as designers prioritize the user experience, there is a parallel story running here, one of technical feasibility, one of viability, or rather, like I say, the how. Understanding the how behind our craft is just as crucial as the purpose, intention, and experience. It's about appreciating those mechanics behind the surface that code underlining your design. And it's here that we transition from just coming up with ideas that are on purpose to actually creating them, to exposing them to the world. So I encourage you, learn the basics of engineering. It doesn't mean that you need to replace the engineers in your room. That's not at all the goal here. Our goal is to augment designers, or augment developers with design now, WordPress is great for this, right? There are so many different tiers of engineering that we can lean into. I know a lot of people, including myself, who have started with themes, becoming a tinkerer, right? Where you start by perhaps making small changes to a theme. Maybe it's a small CSS tweak. Maybe the next step is to lean into the code a little bit. You pull it into a code editor just to see what's there. What are template parts? What are patterns? What is the theme.json file? How do these interplay with each other? The next step might be building plugins. WordPress.org has so many plugins that you can just observe and look into for free and learn from, and just inviting curiosity to go in and explore how did someone do this? Why did they make the decisions they made? And the next step from there is you could reach out to that developer and actually talk to them. There's probably a lot of them in the room here or at the conference. Yeah, I think leaning in on this idea of multiple tiers is imperative because we as designers, uh, we can start at any one of these tiers. They're not just for developers. They're for all of us in the room here. You can lean into blocks. You could start building 
a little bit of React applications by looking at the Gutenberg repo and just understanding what's going on here. Ask a friend and ask me. I'm, I'm here all weekend. I would love to help you. One step further here, you're actually contributing co WordPress code into Core that can run on potentially hundreds of millions of websites. That's the power of WordPress that no other platform even comes close to achieving. And that's something we need to hold dear to and keep pursuing and keep growing as designers as we lean into it. Now, by augmenting developers, what I mean to is by adding to. You know, augmenting means to make something greater to add to it. And um, when I think of augmenting, I, I, I come back to a story of when I first started out as a designer. I was making email headers and landing pages, which is kind of rough cutting some ideas as a junior designer to fill out uh, what style did I want to go for. Uh, my engineering team would come back, and they would show me what they made, and a designer's worst nightmare is that it looks awful. It doesn't look like what you intended. It's really off. So uh, talking with the project manager, it became clear that my designs were too complicated. I didn't understand the system that I was designing for. So we met after work with one of my engineer friends, and he showed me a little bit of how WordPress works for the very first time. We added a button to the header of a site just to see what it is. I started diving in and understanding that system. I shared some of my skills, so we did some skill swapping. And collectively, we started launching really beautiful projects pretty fast because we both had that shared understanding. So augment those developers around you because it creates a more purposeful work environment, there's mutual respect, and you get to collaborate with other smart people. It's amazing. We're people, right? We're meant to collaborate. We're designed to design, even. At the core of all these principles, all these ideas of what design is, how its purpose, intention, experience, and engineering, is one common thread that I've kind of hinted to throughout. Design is human. Design is uniquely human. It reflects the creativity, the planning, and the intentionality in creating functional and, yes, aesthetic systems and objects. Now, this creative impulse leads us to the heart of human-centric design, where we're designing not just for users and for people, but rather with them, where every curve, every color, every line that we draw is with the deep understanding of how it will be perceived, interacted with, and experienced by the people using it. It's about creating solutions that are not only purposeful and intuitive and even technically sound, but deeply resonant on a human level. And for WordPress, this is more important than ever that we accomplish this. Now, a fundamental truth of design, of our craft, is that design is subjective. It's shaped by our own experiences, our own past, our perceptions, expectations, our cultural background, our taste. If it's, if it's happened, it's shaped you. Now, our role as designers is to navigate these subjective waters and craft experiences that resonate with a diverse audience. Balancing those subjective elements that are there and acknowledging them with objective purpose. It's a process of continuously learning and adapting and growing, being curious as a designer. Yes, like Yang did in the park those early mornings, observing and watching, putting the time in with the people that we're designing for and with. In embracing the, sub the subjectivity of design, we not only acknowledge the individuality of people, but rather celebrate it as a core aspect of humanity. Design is purpose. Design is intention, experience, engineering, and human. Design is all of us in the room here and everything that we craft. So if there's one thing I could say last, it's just take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, we have some time now for questions. So um, if anyone has a question, please stick up your hand. We've got one down here to kick us off. Hello. Thank you. That was very good. 
Um, I have a question. Yesterday I was at Contributor, Contributor Day and there was no table lead for design. So yes. my question is simple is, how it is valued and what is the current state of design within WordPress? Because uh, even the Slack, even the, the channel, it, it feels pretty empty. Yes. The, the hardest part about working collaboratively across a project like WordPress is being where the work is. It's, it's really tough. It's really tough because the work is happening in GitHub, right? We're, we're on track. We're pushing things forward as an a a, a engineering-led organization, in, in essence. It's tough to be, from a design perspective, somewhere else. So what I would encourage is to dive into, again, learning a little bit about GitHub, understanding what's happening there, and following some of the tags and resources on GitHub in our repos that really help orient designers. Um, and then, and the purpose of Slack, we need to share more. I think we need to be more open to ask questions of each other, ask for feedback. Uh, putting ideas in Slack for other designers is great, or even on the Make WordPress blog. I think we can connect and generally share more so that we learn more together and push design forward in WordPress. But is there something, somebody to lead or someone we can talk to or just to, you know, yes. show the, the first steps? Yeah, because all the, the, the other table had some mentoring yes. or things like that. It was really disappointing. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to help you. Um, I'm happy to take on folks. I know we do have a mentoring team as well. Um, I think the, the tough part you know, yesterday was that we have so many tables and a lot of needs for design. So it's sometimes difficult to focus in on one table instead of spreading out um, design over the tables. But maybe we can adapt so next year there's a period where we come together and then we kind of move out uh, into different tables and help support engineering. It's a good idea. Thank you. Um, I'll come to you. Thank you. Some more questions? Yep, we've got one just down here, I think was the next one, and then I see one up the back. So you mentioned about um, designers leaning into engineering. Yes. Uh, so my question is about uh, the converse, like what can engineers do to understand a little bit about design? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, like when my, me and my friend, when we started trading skills, the, the number one thing he needed to know uh, first was what are the systems that I use? What do I value as a designer? And how do I communicate so that he understands? And so if we understand the same language, um, whether it's uh, metrics, you know, all those like small words that we use as designers in Figma even, trying to correlate that into everyday normal talk so that we can both communicate along the same lines. Um, so I would encourage engineers to lean into design just as much as design to lead into engineering. Okay. So my question is like, what would be a good first step to, it would be to connect to a designer and understand the tools that uh, yeah. she uses um, and the vocabulary? Um, I think to ask, yeah, okay. to share feedback and, and ask. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The next one was up the back there with the check shirt. Yep. Kevin. Hey, Rich. Hey. Standing room only. This is nice. Um, <laughs> with WordPress, you know, and WP admin specifically, um, design can be all over the place. Once you install a couple plugins, right, you get flashes of greens, reds, whatever, and user interfaces are all over the place. And I think that's a, becoming a huge problem. It's been a problem. So I just want to know your take on standardization of that and how we can become more. Uh, Noel in his talk earlier touched on this. Yeah. And I think it's a really uh, important conversation. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think we're at this pivotal time in WordPress as we or theorizing what this new admin experience feels like, that we lean in collectively as designers and put our best ideas forward so that we can actually come up with solutions that are novel and creative enough to where there's still personality. It's not a, a WordPress that lacks personality, and even brands could still have personality and ownership, just like applications on our phones and our other devices. Um, so we're at this point where if, if we do that, this is the best opportunity to lean forward and do that, uh, to make essentially many applications in WordPress. Um, otherwise, we'll end up with the same scenario 10 years down the road where it's a hot mess, and we don't, we don't want that. Any other questions? Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, I do have one question about like uh, design thinking. Like, uh, have you ever encountered a situation that you notice there's a problem, there's an intention, and you want to fulfill it, but however, your leadership feel like that's not creating profit, that's not beneficial to your overall customer. What will you do in that situation? Yeah, uh, that's that's probably more common than we think. You know, I think as designers, we like to pitch ideas, and it's important to also be okay with something that doesn't, that doesn't land. Um, what I would do in that case is really try to sell what I'm thinking is important and, and figure out what are the objections. Like what is, what is the pushback here? Is it just a monetary thing? Is, it, is there a bigger picture problem? Is there something I'm not understanding roadmap wise? And try to meet in the middle in that area. And perhaps it's just not the right time for that particular effort, um, which is also a very valid reason to stop. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yep, there's one over here. Hello. Uh, I really like what you talked about uh, design being human centric. But um, more often than not, uh, design is mostly, I mean, not most of the time, design is bounded by the technology that, we are, that WordPress is providing. No, I was actually wondering what's the WordPress direction on this to allow, you know, designers to create more human-centric uh, de uh, designs and for the engineers to easily implement them. That's that's, that's a great question. Um, I think we're at, you know, like what I mentioned to Devin here. I think we're at this point where we need to come up with systems that are maintainable and scalable uh, within this new paradigm that we're shifting towards. Um, we have an opportunity to create these experiences that are very refined because we have so much experience within WordPress. We have lots of understanding with how the product is used because so many people use it. Um, but I, what I would encourage is to share your ideas, share your ideas um, on your blog even, like write and just publicly put it out there because lots of us can learn from each of our individual um, learnings on the design front and what you think is important uh, might also be what someone else in the room thinks imp is important and it, when you collaborate together it surfaces to the top and we could get it in yep there's one down here it's a big triangle um <laughs> thanks for the talk rich that was really informative um, my question specifically relates to sort of the whole failing fast yes. um, idea. Uh, my, my question is, how complex should you make the success criteria for an MVP, and how much input should you seek, uh, just so that it is able to be proved out properly, but not so complex that it slows down the design process? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, failing fast is really important to me. I, what I like to do is almost hack it together, hack together ideas. Don't worry about the fluff, all the, all the pieces of the puzzle that need to be there one day, because if the idea doesn't work, we shouldn't be worrying about those extra pieces. So as long as you can prove out something that is possible, like you know your right solution based on the right problem and you try it quickly, then great. Um, if it's something that's massive, you have to cut it down. Like it has to be a day or two even, like small prototyping to move in the right direction. Otherwise, we just get lost in that, you know, just coming up with ideas and leaning into directions that will probably end up getting blocked. Yeah. Other questions? Put your hand up high. We've got a bit more time, so don't hold back. If there's any niggling question you wanted to ask Rich. Okay. Oh, there's one. Yes. Hi, Rich. Hi. Um, nice to see you here. Um, can you share about how design um, team make decision about design for WordPress? Because it's open source, it's yes. not a typical like design and customer thing, right? Yes. Can you share about how how the design team make a decision for release or launch? Thank you. Yeah, that's it's a complicated one. You know, with the open source project, there are a lot of designers, a lot of developers, uh, engineers to really lean in on. Um, I would say the, the biggest push to get something into the project is to be super passionate about it. Pitch it to lots of people. See if there's other interests. See if you can get people on your team to help you move something forward. 
And, and the best ideas come from those people who really care about it. And that's what's great about WordPress because we all have those, those pieces of us that are very different, but we also have something that's familiar. We all want WordPress to be better, right? So as we lean into that, I just encourage you to share with people, get people on board, push ideas forward. And um, that's, that's what I do. And I know a lot of other people that do the same thing. And I'd love to see more of that even. Um, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, as a normal person, that we uh, it's really hard for a normal person to de uh, define what is beauty. <laughs> Sometimes for me, I, I actually, I'm trying to design a website. I find like it's really like geek design, <laughs> and then like, so do you have any idea other than we can learn like good design or any reference website in, or reference books? Uh, I like the um, the book, um, The Design of Everyday Things. It's kind of an older book, but it's a, a very, very classic view of, of a, a lot of the similar things that I think are important here, um, where it talks about design as an art, as a craft, uh, the foundational pieces. Um, and then from there, learn into, uh, I would lean into the direction of, of your interest. So if it's um, building websites, like try to look at other websites, see what seems to be collectively interesting, but then also keep you what's cool and interesting to you because your style is nice it's fun it's interesting um, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it's bad because like I don't know what your angle is um, because I think the personality that we impart in our designs is, is, is super paramount to making design amazing and beautiful thank you yeah We've got time for another one or two questions if there is anything burning that you had to ask <laughs> Hi, Rich. Uh, Hi. This is such, such a nice session. I enjoyed it a lot. My question is sometimes I struggle with to make, I worked with a design team. Uh, so it, it's been a struggle to make decision about responsive and adaptive design. Can you give me some ideas that how can I make decision on responsive or adaptive design? Yeah. Do you mean uh, the, like in the editor itself? Uh, yeah, editor itself. Okay. How can we make a design responsive? But sometimes it takes so much time to make design responsive. Uh, Maybe that in that case scenario, we can make the design adaptive. So how can we make decision on that, uh, to make the design adaptive or responsive? Can you uh, give me some scenario or examples? Uh, I mean, when I, when I think of that, um, I lean in towards, um, you know, when I, when I create, uh, I mean, all of us, or most of us in the room, and we've created Instagram stories or whatnot. When you put text on there and you re resize it, and it looks fine everywhere. Like I, I lean into experiences that, uh, maybe are not so integer driven, like it's not like a value, but it's more of like a perception, like what do I want this to be? And I think as, as we're developing you know, the editor and leaning into responsive controls and trying to understand what can we do to make uh, like a naturally inherit website that just feels right everywhere, um, I lean into those future thinking ideas instead of, instead of trying to use something that's uh, perhaps proven but also behind us. So I, I, I'm, I'm open to ideas if folks have um, interesting concepts that you've explored and how to leverage better uh, adaptive or responsive design elements in the editor. Yeah. Great, thank you so much again, Rich. We have a little gift for you um, from the organizers ah, as well. Thank you. So thank you so much. <laughs> Round of applause for Rich.